Uh, and thank you for uh, being here in the room if you're one of the media folks present. Uh, yesterday we obviously gave you a lot more information than normal, so today's uh, prepared remarks are relatively brief, and then we'll get to your questions. Uh, so getting right into the latest numbers that we received today, uh, we are reporting 218 new cases. Uh, that brings us to a total of 27,286. Um, and so obviously that is, that is a good number to report on a Tuesday because there have been some times when Tuesdays were, were really high. The other good number is that that's on a total of 4,119 new tests. Uh, so the, the percentage of, of uh, tests that were positive was 5.3%, uh, which too is encouraging. Uh, unfortunately, however, we do have 61 new deaths to report uh, today. Um, and, you know, you've been hearing me report similar numbers uh, for a long time now, um, and I don't want anybody to think that, that uh, these are really numbers. These are obviously people, and, and this is very tragic. Obviously, I and the rest of the state are very much looking forward to the day when the number of deaths is zero. Um, and it's also true that, that as we reported, I think it was, it was last week, um, the number of deaths is higher than we would expect it to be uh, given the, the uh, number of cases that we have and the, the rate of transmission that we really think is, is going on. Um, and we, we're continuing to look at that and trying to figure out why that is. Um, currently we have 1,666 patients hospitalized uh, with 244 of those on ventilators. Uh, and the grand total of tests that have been completed is a little over 151,000. Um, and um, interestingly, today we went back to number five in the nation in per capita uh, tests, I'm, I'm sorry, cases. Uh, so, because we had slid down to six yesterday, I think, I think we just traded spots with Rhode Island today. Uh, speaking of testing, I will tell you that the, the best news that we had yesterday uh, in the White House's Coronavirus uh, Task Force telephone conference uh, with the nation's governors was the commitment that the federal government made uh, through Admiral Giroir. Um, and if, if I haven't told you all this, he is a Louisiana native, by the way, um, and, and that the task force will support our efforts here in Louisiana starting in the month of May, uh, to reach 200,000 tests per month. That's a significant ramp up um, from where we are right now. We just told you we've done a little over 151,000 tests, and that dates all the way back to early March. Uh, so to get to 200,000 tests in one month uh, is going to be significant. Um, and, and it's also critically important because we need to have this testing in place so that we can monitor what's going on out across the state of Louisiana and every community, uh, and it will inform our contact tracing uh, and so forth. Uh, so in incredibly important that we do that um, uh, in, in terms of getting to 200,000 tests uh, per month. We also have uh, new information on the Department of Health, Health dashboard right now. It breaks down um, information by gender and sex. Uh, today, it's reporting, for example, that 57% of the COVID-19 deaths in Louisiana have been among men. Obviously, um, they're 43% among women. And interestingly, uh, each has 50% of the cases. Uh, so you can see this and other important information by visiting ldh.la.gov. Um, before I open the floor to questions, uh, couple of other things, uh, one of which is there is uh, severe weather moving across North Louisiana right now that we want everyone to pay attention to. Um, that could continue through the day. So, so please uh, uh, watch for that. Um, it's enhanced risk of severe weather, thunderstorms, um, some uh, flash flooding, hail, potentially tornadoes. And, and that's, I know we've had to make that announcement a number of times over the last several weeks. Uh, and it and it's, seems to be uh, hitting North Louisiana uh, at a regular clip, but I'm asking people to pay attention to that and certainly keep their cell phone handy because you will get your last and best warning 
uh, about a tornado on that cell phone. We've also had uh, many generous donations uh, throughout the course of our efforts to respond to COVID-19, um, and it's helped to make that response more successful than it otherwise would have been. Um, and I want to thank all of those individuals. You know, at the state level, we've been working with LSU, LDEQ, GOSEP, uh, and prison enterprises to produce enough hand sanitizer to fill approximately 48,000 16 ounce bottles um, and all of the raw materials were donated uh, Exxon Mobil, for example here in Baton Rouge donated 4,600 gallons of isopropyl alcohol in addition they've been manufacturing their own medical grade sanitizer for our state and for other states who need them Procter and Gamble in Alexandria has donated 60 gallons of glycerol and Salve Industries in Baton Rouge has donated 100 gallons of peroxide Additionally, we've received more than 2 million cotton masks from Hanes, uh, which have been distributed to parishes based on population. Some of those masks were kept by GOSEPT uh, in case we have to do congregate sheltering in the hurricane season or, or for any other natural disaster. So it's very helpful with those masks. I think you were supporting, supporting one of those today, weren't you? Okay. Um, You'll no doubt see uh, and, and have seen parishes giving these masks out to the public. Each parish will have the ability to decide for itself how to distribute its masks. Um, and obviously, if you have the ability to make your own masks uh, for you and your family, I hope that you will do that and leave those masks uh, at the parish level for those who, who don't have that uh, ability. The Tencent Foundation has donated a nearly um, I'm sorry, nearly 400,000 KN95 masks to GOSEP for distribution to the 504 Health Net in New Orleans and to the Biomedical Research Foundation of Northwest Louisiana. Um, you know, I've said many times that prayer and faith are really important to me and I know to the vast majority of people in Louisiana. Uh, and many churches and places of worship have had to come up with creative ways to reach their parishioners as a result of this public health emergency, and many of them have done so. Uh, and I'm grateful for all of their hard work to do that and the work that they're doing to help us fight against this disease. And I wanna let you know that the Times-Picayune and the New Orleans uh, Advocate and the Advocate in partnership with Raising Canes has created an online directory of religious services called the Faith in the Community Initiative. Uh, you will be able to find information on how to stream virtual services and you can get that information um, by going to nola.com slash faith in the community. nola.com slash faith in the community. And that's also where churches would go in order to register on that directory. And if they want in, uh, individuals to be able to find uh, where they can find their services. And finally, um, there are a lot of people who are disappointed, and I'm one of them, that the Zurich Classic will not take place in New Orleans this year. I did not take place. However, even though the event's canceled, they're leaving the tournament funds in place so that the roughly $2 million charitable impact of that tournament will still happen. Uh, critically important uh, for the state of Louisiana and the New Orleans area and very generous of the Zurich uh, folks. And so wanted to call um, them out on that and just, just um, let them know how much we appreciate that. It's very generous. Um, you know, from the very beginning of this crisis, I've talked about how every person in Louisiana has a role to play. Uh, and we have a responsibility to stay home, to social distance, to wear masks in order to protect ourselves, our families, uh, and our neighbors. Um, some have the very critical role, obviously, being on the front lines as healthcare workers. Uh, and they have been doing that in tremendous fashion all across the state of Louisiana. Um, and I, on behalf of the entire state, want to again thank them. Uh, for their heroic work. Uh, my commitment, obviously, as the governor is to do everything that I can to protect the people of Louisiana uh, in this public health emergency. Uh, we're going to continue to do that as best we can, guided by uh, science and, and data, uh, and working with stakeholders uh, across the spectrum. So with that, we're going to get to a couple of questions from the public. I think I'll take the first one. and. I'm gonna ask Dr. B.U. to take the second one. 
Uh, we've received a lot of questions recently about masks, uh, which are critical for, to protecting each other as we continue to work to flatten the curve and slow the spread of COVID-19. And fortunately or unfortunately, I think masks are going to be with us for a long time um, and part of the new normal uh, until such time as there's a vaccine and so forth. Um, Kristen asked, at what age should children start wearing masks and should daycare workers caring for infants and young children uh, wear masks? Uh, masks are recommended for every person over the age of two unless that individual has uh, breathing challenges that make it where they just shouldn't wear a mask. Uh, and masks or face coverings should be worn indoors and outdoors uh, by everyone anytime that they're going to be near others who are not members of their immediate household. This does include daycare settings and it applies to the workers and to the children who are over two years old. And I'm going to ask Dr. Bu to come up and, and respond to a question from Susan and then we'll take your questions. Uh, and so Susan asks, please demonstrate uh, how to correctly wear a mask and explain the importance of this. So, uh, you know, the, the governor's previously said that, that he and I wear masks um, uh, when, we're, when we're out and about uh, a town separately. Um, we also wear masks here where we're working uh, closely together with others and people at home can't see, but uh, your, your press are all wearing uh, masks as well. And the importance is that when I wear a cloth mask, not a medical grade mask, but a cloth mask, I'm limiting the, the, the potential virus that's shedding out of my face, um, spreading uh, to others. And so if we're all wearing masks, we are limiting the likelihood that if any of us are asymptomatic or symptomatic, that um, we are shedding virus towards each other. So it's important that we do this mutually. Masks, uh, these cloth masks are not designed to protect you. They're really to protect everyone else. And that's why we need everybody to wear them. So if everybody protects everyone else, then you're protected as well. Um, so the proper way to, to wear one is, is pretty important because the way that you wear a mask could make it more or less effective. When you're not wearing your mask, we recommend that you do store it um, in a bag. Uh, here I've got a clear plastic bag. And I have my mask folded such that the inside part of the mask is, uh, is covering, uh, is touching together. So I'm not uh, exposing the, the part that's going to be on my face. And then I put it over my ear and critically try to adjust it as little as possible. And importantly, the mask needs to cover my nose and my mouth. You need to make sure that you've got the right size mask. And if you're making your own masks at home, you know, do a little bit of adjustment and measuring. You want to make sure it's not so loose that the mask is falling down constantly. Uh, you also want to make sure that it's not so tight that it's going to irritate you a lot and you have to touch it. The idea is you want to touch your mask as little as possible. And in general, as we've been saying from the beginning, touch your face as little as, as possible. Um, next, when you're, when you're uh, taking off your mask, and really I should have even done this before I put on my mask, you need to wash your hands because you're now going to touch your face. So put a little bit of uh, hand sanitizer to clean my hands. And now just using the ear loops, taking the mask off, fold it in half again, the outside part of the mask. I'm going to fold it one more time so it fits in my bag. And then I'm putting my mask back in my bag. And then I can carry that with me uh, without, without any problems. I'm going to put this mask on as soon as we're done with the press conference. Um, luckily, I'm keeping mostly six feet away from all of y'all. Uh, but really, again, as the governor said, any time that you're around individuals who are not in your immediate household, indoors or outdoors, we want you staying at least six feet away. But even better, in addition to that, we'll be wearing your mask uh, as well. Um, do want you to clean your masks uh, every day. It's important uh, that they stay clean. Um, so wash and dry. Um, you can put them in your laundry. You can hand wash them and, and dry them. Uh, but, but that's going to be pretty critical. And if they get dirty during the day, you need to take it off and, and put on uh, another mask. Thank you. So those of you who hadn't seen uh, the Haynes mask before, that was one of the Haynes masks that we distributed, almost 2 million of those around the state of Louisiana. So with that, we'll take your questions. Yes, sir. Greg. Governor, you had you said yesterday, which Dr. B confirmed that you had um, uh, unanimously from your medical expert team to extend the order. Did you have any counter advice from your senior staff that's, that, that's not part of your medical team? No. The, of course, and they had the benefit of sitting through all the presentations and looking at the data um, that, that we came in across all of the, the criteria that we were looking for uh, in terms of symptoms, cases, hospitalization, uh, and then also knowing what the timeline is going forward with respect to the testing. I just told you about the 200,000 tests that we should reach in May 
and also the contact tracing uh, capacity. And all of that work together. Um, and, and also knowing that, that Louisiana is a hot spot state. And if you recall, even back when the, the president um, released his plan for reopening America, uh, he indicated that May 1st was a good date and that it would, it would work for a lot of states, but not uh, hot spot states. And there's not been a single conversation that I'm aware of in many weeks now, if you were talking about hotspots where you didn't talk about uh, Louisiana. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a stretch. Now we were all disappointed because we were all hoping uh, that when we sat down and looked at the 14 days worth of data, uh, that we would have improved to the point where we could safely uh, move uh, to phase one. Uh, and that just wasn't the case. But another reason that, that informed uh, the decision and which, which I think led to it being unanimous with the, with the senior staff uh, was that when we looked at how much of the economy we had left open in Louisiana to begin with uh, compared to some other states, that, that we already had uh, considerable parts of our economy open. And again, today, I'm sorry, yesterday we, we had reopened the uh, non-emergency medical and um, surgical procedures we had left retail open um, if they weren't essential, um, but hadn't been closed. And obviously we're talking there about bars and barbershops and salons and that sort of stuff. Uh, and that we had followed all of the CISA guidance uh, so that everything that CISA had determined, uh, and now it's been through three iterations of, of their listing of critical infrastructure had, had been left open as, as well. Uh, so for all of those reasons, uh, we, we felt the right thing to do was to continue the stay at home order for two more weeks, uh, make sure we didn't have a hot spot uh, pop up uh, until we had the ability, knew we had the ability to test it uh, and so forth. And then the, these two weeks just, just made sense uh, from that perspective. Yes, ma'am. Governor, some other states have, because of the, the budget concerns, have started furloughing state workers or doing hiring freezes or spending freezes on non-emergency items. Is that something you're considering for Louisiana statewide, or is it something that even individual agencies have started doing? Well, we, we are going to consider whatever becomes necessary for us to, to do things that are fiscally uh, prudent. The good news for us as we finish up the current fiscal year, as you will recall, we we running a significant um, um, excess in the current year. I was about to say surplus, but surplus supplies are going backwards. Uh, so we're running a significant excess. Uh, we will have an REC meeting uh, in the middle of May, I think around May the 14th, uh, and we will we will figure out what that number is today. Um, but but for the year that ends on June 30th, uh, in good shape, where the the changes will likely come for will be the year uh, that starts July 1st, and of course we have to have that REC. Uh, meeting and then that's going to inform the whole budget process and everything else uh, But that excess that we had along with surplus from the previous year really has put Louisiana in a much better uh, Position than other states and then the other states have some some of them uh, have different fiscal years Some of them go from January 1st to December 31st some go from July 1st the way we do uh, to June 30th and others I think mirror the federal fiscal year October the 1st to September the 30th. And I don't know where those states are in their budget years, uh, but we're wrapping up one year and preparing for the next. And so that's one of the reasons we haven't had to take those actions, along with the fact that we've had surplus from, from the previous year and excess in the current year. Yes, sir. Governor, you talked about the commitments the federal government's made regarding testing. How many specific tests have they committed? Did they commit a specific number to Louisiana? And also, you mentioned the possibility that we're going to start testing asymptomatic people. Yeah. I know in recent weeks you've said these tests don't work for asymptomatic people. Um, can you address why we are now moving to tests for asymptomatic people with the timeline? Yeah. Um, so, so the number is 200,000. Uh, that was the plan that we submitted, I want to say, last Wednesday. Uh, to the CDC, uh, it has been it has been approved, um, and in fact, when when they um, gave the uh, announcement yesterday uh, in that video telephone conference, I think every state's plan had been has been approved. We expect to to start next week or in the first week in May, uh, which is next week, that we're going to start receiving weekly allocations 
uh, that will increase over time, but will get us to that 200,000. And what we're talking about are those test kits. So these are swabs. This is um, the biotransport medium, uh, what test tubes and reagent. Uh, though, and which, which, by the way, great news because these are the things that have been hardest to get. Um, and so the 200,000 uh, that, that we say need, we, that we need, they will be providing those to us starting next month. And that's in addition to our current capacity that we already have? Yeah, well, it'll be in addition to whatever we can get from other sources. Now, um, the, the truth is, if we get 200,000 from the federal government, we won't need uh, very many from other sources, and the additional testing that we will do uh, might uh, involve more things like the serology testing, for example, for, for antibodies. Um, but really, this, this support that we're getting from the federal government is, is critically important. And then yesterday, and you probably heard uh, this discussed at the um, President's press conference last night. I wasn't able to watch it. Um, but they released a blueprint and a plan for testing, which basically is guidance to the states on the things that we should be looking at uh, when it comes uh, to testing. Uh, and Dr. Biu had, had already been working on our plan. Uh, the, the guidance we got from the federal government do dovetails very well with what we were already planning to do here in Louisiana. And as you mentioned, for the first time, um, the federal government, or at least the first time to my knowledge, uh, Dr. Burks started talking about the need to test asymptomatic people. Uh, and, and the reason is we have a better understanding on a couple of things. One is that there is a significant percentage of people out there who are either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, yet they're COVID-19 positive and producing shedding virus, I should say, which means they're contagious. Uh, and so as we seek to keep a lid on this uh, and to keep the case number as low as possible, uh, then, then transitioning to testing these individuals, especially when you have the additional capacity to do it, uh, is going to be critically important. Um, and uh, the, the second part of that is, and, and, and this is a somewhat of assumption on my part, and I'm going to ask Dr. Biu to come up and, and ex expand on this, is that they now believe that these tests are have uh, more accuracy with respect to individuals who are asymptomatic. Initially, um, what we were told, and we were told this for, for quite a long time, is that, that asymptomatic individuals would, um, would be at greater risk for getting a false result. Uh, and if they were asymptomatic, then the false result would be that they were negative when, in fact, they were positive. Uh, and, and Dr. B, you probably have some, some more updated information on that, so I'll ask him to come up here and share it with you. Uh yeah, and, and, you know, along the lines of what the governor was saying, we have a lot more information not only from national researchers, but just uh, looking at data in our own hands, uh, that there are significant numbers of people who uh, don't have symptoms that are uh, shedding virus, and most concerningly, when we talk about places where people are living in close proximity. For us, the biggest concerns there are nursing homes, long-term care facilities, prisons, and the like, and I think where we've seen um, uh, the CDC uh, do investigations in, uh, in a nursing home in, in Seattle uh, or a homeless shelter in Seattle. Uh, both of those studies indicated that at the time that there was an initial outbreak when they tested the entire population, there was some value to identifying that there were a group of folks who they could identify virus in who had no symptoms, some of whom never went on to develop symptoms, some of whom did develop symptoms over time. And so when we're talking about what's the risk to that population, how do we reduce the likelihood that somebody is shedding and unaware of it and then continuing to spread uh, COVID in that uh, congregate setting, in that close living environment? We think that there's really more and more evidence now that, that the asymptomatic testing um, is going to be helpful for, for those individuals. Now, if somebody tests negative, everything that we said before still applies. They could still very well be in that period of early incubation and not yet shedding virus. And so what we are working with the CDC and others on is uh, determining how frequently we would need to test those people who test negative in a congregate setting, in one of those close living environments, to make sure that as somebody develops symptoms, they're not given this false sense of reassurance and saying I'm negative, so I can just you know um, uh, go on about my day. We wanna make sure that it's, it's clear that we need to continue to test those individuals uh, over their period of, of potential exposure to make sure that they don't develop um, uh, uh, certainly shedding, and then obviously once they're symptomatic, they would be tested anyway. 
So we're talking about nursing homes and prisons and, and In the initial phases, we're talking about especially those areas where we think people are going to come in the closest proximity. Now, it still could be happening in the general public. The risk is much lower because the likelihood that you are going to be around such a large number of people um, that may never have been exposed to the virus is less because we're all following social distancing, we're all wearing masks. Uh, but in those settings where people have to live close to each other, we think that there may be a benefit to actually doing that testing for asymptomatic we'll individuals. Are going to test all nursing home patients in Louisiana, for instance? So we'll have to see. I mean, there are still uh, uh, many facilities that do not have any COVID cases. So I don't think I would start going out and testing entire facilities that have no indication that COVID has, has reached their doors, especially given that while we are uh, excited and grateful that there will be um, uh, testing resources coming to the state, 200,000 is still not enough to test you know, 4.7 million Louisianans. So, so we still need to be thinking about who's priority for testing, making sure that those individuals, especially the most vulnerable individuals to COVID-19, uh, get as much um, uh, testing and, and, and head warning as possible. For me? Actually, for you. Yesterday, we talked about this Yale study Washington Post reported. Did you get a chance to look at that? I haven't looked at that specific study, no. Well, they're saying that the deaths, death break from this could be way underreported. Mm -hmm. And then the London Times, the Financial Times in London, did a similar study, and they said that they agreed with that, that's, that maybe it might be as low as 60% across 14 countries. How could that be? How, how is it there could be such a lag, or we could be that far off on deaths? Yeah, so I think the, the, what a lot of these stories are hitting on is that, you know, overall, while we're seeing certainly COVID-related deaths are, are a new uh, classification that's increasing, uh, deaths in other categories seem to be down. We don't know how much of that is actually that there's lower levels of, of, of deaths, uh, for instance, as we talked about yesterday, heart attacks, strokes, um, or if it's that there are individuals who are dying, we're unclear why they died, and they're being put in this unclassified category. Right now, to my knowledge, we haven't really seen that where there's this sort of unclassified group. But I think what these researchers are usually doing is saying if there's a group of folks that are dying unclassified, those could be COVID deaths. And thus, there's a, lot of, a large number of COVID deaths that we're not uh, characterizing. Again, I, I can't tell you with any certainty, and I don't think anybody can. What I can tell you is in Louisiana, we have two policies that I think make that less likely. One is we do encourage our coroners and our physicians and providers uh, to, uh, whenever possible, test somebody who they suspect may have died of COVID um, while, while they're still able to, within that three days that they're, they're with the body. And that will give us some, some testing data that will tell us right off the bat, were they actually positive or negative. And then we've also given, the second policy is we've given uh, coroners and physicians the ability, if we can't test that body during the, the three days that we have uh, the individual, um, to say this was a probable COVID-related death. And, and after we gave that, that uh, authority and looking through uh, the number of deaths, we only have, again, I think it's something like 59 or 60 uh, probable COVID-related deaths in comparison with the, the sadly larger number that we have of confirmed deaths. So I think in Louisiana, we're trying to take steps to really be as inclusive as possible um, and really sort of measure how much impact this is having. Well, they said that Louisiana was good because the testing rate was higher than most other states, and they expect a spike in deaths in Florida and Texas. Who, by the way, are starting to open up. They're starting to reopen. And, uh, and none of the nine states that have reopened or reopening right now have met the criteria from the White House. So, so I guess I'm questioning why are we paying attention to the criteria of the White House? I mean, I understand <laughs> we're protecting public health, but. Well, I, I'll give you my public health answer, which is, you know, we, I think that the criteria that, were, that the White House put out were developed with the CDC and others who were looking at, you know, the same things that we thought were relevant. People who were showing symptoms of COVID, people who were tested and found to have COVID, uh, and, and people who were hospitalized for COVID. We are fortunate that we have been able to have a, a significant amount of testing. We want to do even more than that to put us in a better place. But I think those are the core measures. And, and I think when you look across states, there's not too many states that are saying we want to look at something different. I mean, it's just that's what you're going to look at for COVID. So I think the White House uh, proposals fit a lot with what we're thinking are the important things to look at. And when we look at that data, as we shared yesterday, we don't see that we yet have what we need to safely be able to have people um, uh, you know, reopen and, and go back to, to aspects of, of uh, public sector or private sector. Dr. Bu, is there a scenario or a phase to the new testing when eventually people in the general population who are asymptomatic will be tested, not necessarily people in nursing homes or prisons? So, so there's no easy answer to that. What I will say is that any test that we do in a medical setting Actually, the, the uh, way that that test works or how much we can uh, rely on it really depends on what we're testing for, how frequent that is in the community. 
So the longer we uh, continue doing what we're doing, the less COVID there is in the community, the harder it makes to, to um, make that judgment about that false positive or false negative test. You, a situation where you have lots of people with, with uh, COVID-19, we can rely a lot on those results. As we get fewer and fewer people, you worry that the chances that what I'm seeing is a false positive or false negative increases. So what I would say is over time, we're increasing our capacity to test many more people. We wanna focus on those people in those high risk settings. But what may also be happening at the same time is that the amount of COVID in our community should continue to decrease. And so it's gonna be, have to, have to, it's gonna be something we're gonna to have to look at over time. What probably will continue to increase though is our interest in looking at the serologies. If people have been exposed to the, to the virus, have developed an antibody immune response to it, that's one where I think over time, we're gonna to continue to wanna to see more and more of those tests deployed. I will look into Mesa's now and come back up. One, one point I did want to make, because this gets lost on people, I think, sometimes. A negative test, and let's assume that a, it's a negative test for COVID-19 and that it's accurate. That individual does not have COVID-19. It doesn't mean that individual wouldn't be positive the next day. And so people need to understand that. A negative test doesn't mean you, you don't have it and you're never going to get it. So if you test negative today and develop symptoms tomorrow, you need to go get tested again. Uh, because that's just the, the nature of, of how these these tests work. And, and so I, I wanted to, to share that all, all that with you. And um, with that, I will resume my questions. Yes. Governor, as the legislature prepares to resume its work, maybe as early as Monday, <clears throat> the Senate president told me this afternoon that he didn't feel he'd been forthcoming with him and with the speaker of, of information. He said uh, he's very disappointed in the level of communication. And that he understands that you might have called mayors and other people before you called he and the speaker. Maybe he said 10 minutes before. I don't know. Obviously, I wouldn't have called. So is that something that surprises you? or? Do you, is, well, do you it surprises me and disappoints me because last week uh, I met here in person with both the speaker and the president, uh, talked about the, the um, White House guidelines that we would be following in order to figure out whether we transition this week uh, to phase one or not. I told them exactly what that process would look like uh, and, and that I couldn't make any commitments at that time, but that I would follow the, the science, look at the data, and either we satisfy the criteria or, or we don't. Uh, and then had a conversation with him yesterday before coming in to here. Um, and so I don't, you know, I think it's unfortunate that he said that, and I'll be happy to, to talk to him and to the speaker uh, some more about that. But but there wasn't anything that, that I, as far as I'm concerned, that should have been a surprise or caught him unaware um, because we, we made a decision based on 14 days. You have to wait until it's time to make the decision to look at the 14 days. It wasn't a decision that I made last week when we had met, obviously. But on that point, it, it seems as though um, legislators are questioning why if you made the decision Sunday night and just wanted to um, get confirmation that the White House didn't change its guidelines Monday, why you didn't start notifying the leadership Sunday night when it seemed like things were shifting in the, in the wrong direction for reopening? Well, you know, we, we had met with, I had conference calls last week with all legislators, well, any legislator who wanted to participate. We had two calls. I had a separate meeting with the speaker and the president and explained to them the, the criteria that we would be using, uh, when we would make a decision and when we would be announcing it. Uh, in advance of announcing the decision, I got back on the phone with the speaker and, and the president. Um, if, if that's not enough communication for them, then, then I'll, I'll call them and, and figure out how we, how we do that differently going forward. Yes, sir. Governor, um, in an interview earlier, uh, Mayor Cantrell said uh, in regards to 2021 Mardi Gras, and this several months away, that's something we have to think about. That's something that obviously is so far down the road. The landscape's going to yeah. change a lot between now and then. Is that something that just has to be decided at a later time? Yeah, I, I think, um, first of all, I didn't hear the question. I didn't hear her response. I'm just hearing what you're saying. Obviously, Mardi Gras 2021 is far enough out that we don't know enough today uh, to, to hazard a guess as to what the circumstances are going to be uh, at that point in time. You know, I've declined to answer questions about what this fall is going to look like, so I'm certainly not going to go uh, to next January and February and, and presume to know. But there will be plenty of time to take those questions up once we know more and, and when it would be. I think 
uh, a better time to, to address those questions. Yes, sir. Governor, on, your, on the order that's going into effect, I guess, Friday, with the restaurants and allowing them to have the outdoor dining, uh, for those customers, are the inside bathrooms available to them? Is, is there any, I've, I've had questions about this. And then what did, what did you, what did you think of uh, another New Orleans mayor, Latoya Cantrell, she's saying she's not gonna allow that. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Well, for, first of all, it is always uh, within a local mayor's uh, prerogative to be more restrictive uh, if he or she chooses to be. Um, and, and so she, she may have particular concerns that I'm not aware of, or j it may just be the urban nature of New Orleans and, and how, and she, she has particular concerns about how that might look uh, and, 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 and function and so forth with, with outdoor seating and, and so forth. Um, with respect to, to the restrooms, uh, I, I will have to get with my team and, and talk about it. That's not something that, that we had a, a discussion of. Um, and obviously we're encouraging people to wash their hands as frequently uh, as possible. Uh, so, so we may need to go back and revisit it. What we were trying to do was to create just one more option. And that is for individuals who are going to a restaurant to pick up a meal and leave. That if there is an outdoor table uh, where they can sit at and consume that meal, they can do so before they leave. Uh, just to try to make it a, a little more convenient for people and do so in a setting uh, that Dr. B.U. and other healthcare professionals believe is much, much safer. Uh, outdoors, the, the risk, uh, especially if you are a safe distance away from the closest people and you're not having people wait on you. Uh, so you wouldn't have an employee bringing you things back and forth from the kitchen or going from one table to the other and contacting different individuals. Uh, so that's what we were trying to do. I'll, I'll, that's one of the reasons we made the announcement on Monday, by the way. So, so we would have an opportunity to take questions and get those uh, things clarified before Friday. And we'll, we'll take a look at that. Uh, but but I do, since you mentioned the word bathroom, I want to take, it is still recommended that people wash their hands with soap and water as frequently as possible. Uh, and so that's something we'll, we'll have to, to look at. Yes, ma'am. Governor, on the uh, unemployment numbers, is there any concern that the state is depleting its unemployment trust fund at a rate that is going to make it either run out or, or problematic to refill? Yeah, well, there's always that trouble when you when you have a situation like this. You know, we started out at over a billion dollars um, in the the uh, trust fund. Uh, I think we're we're still over 900 million dollars in it, um, and when it gets to right around 750 million dollars, there's a reduction in uh, the weekly benefit that gets paid, uh, and also the uh, incumbent worker training program gets discontinued, and you you have different threshold like that. So it certainly is. Uh, something that we are are watching and, and concerned about, um, and uh, and looking for uh, things that we can do to shore up uh, the trust fund in in the short term, um, and and looking at di at different options that we may have. None of which are terribly appealing, but some obviously better than others. Yes, sir. Do you know of any local parish officials that are creating? Um, reopening plans that are less restrictive than the stay-at-home order, which I would take to mean they're in violation of the order. And yeah. also, a, a two-parter, sorry, the $1.8 billion in federal aid, have you made any decisions on how to spend that? Um, the answer to the second question is no. And, and obviously, the guidance that came from uh, Secretary of the Treasury Mnuchin uh, was such that it can only be spent on expenditures related to um, COVID-19. It cannot be spent for, um, to, to make up lost revenue. It cannot be used for that purpose. Um, and, but now we are working with our congressional delegation and through the National Governor Association and directly with the White House to try to figure out what flexibility Congress may create the next time they pass an act that may retroactively make that funding more flexible. Because if they do that, then it's gonna be uh, something that, that more local governments can take advantage of. And as you will remember, 45% of the 1.8 billion, uh, it was the intention of Congress that that go to local government. We, in, we intend to, uh, we intend to uh, 
be faithful with, with what that uh, uh, architecture looked like coming out of Congress where 45% went to the local government and 55% and would stay at the state. Uh, but we're, we're, we're looking to see if there's additional flexibility granted uh, because right now, quite honestly, local government uh, is not really presenting expenditures. They're telling me they need the, the, the funding to offset uh, loss of revenue. That's not an acceptable use. And, and so we, we haven't made any decisions uh, on, on that uh, yet. And, and I'm sorry, your first question? Um, uh, oh, the parish uh, officials? Oh, yeah. Office. I haven't heard of that. And, and certainly um, that's not the way it works. Uh, if, if, a, if a local official who has the authority wants to do something that is more restrictive than my orders, then they can do that. And that has been done uh, in some cases. Um, and, and, but that's, that's not, it's not up to a local official to be less restrictive. Yes, sir. We just crossed over a million uh, cases in the United States, which is one third of all the cases around the world. Mm. Are we any closer to the White House? Said anything about being closer to a vaccine? You know, um, the working assumption that I have is that every day we're closer to a vaccine because I think one's coming. I just don't know when. I did see uh, something in, uh, in the, I didn't, uh, wasn't able to watch the segment. It scrolled across the bottom of the screen, and I don't remember if it was Fox or CNN, that, seven, there was, that said there are seven uh, human trials of vaccines underway right now. So I'm going to pray for, for success uh, in, with a vaccine uh, that will prove safe um, and, and prove effective, uh, and that, that would be fielded just as soon as possible. Um, I know from, from conversations that, that the White House has had going back for many weeks now uh, that, that they're not promising that before another year or so. Um, and, and so and that is one of, the, one of the real things about trying to get back to normal uh, when you have a virus that is so contagious and so deadly and you don't have a vaccine and you don't have yet uh, an approved therapeutic treatment either. Um, unless one just came out, I, I don't think the FDA has approved a therapeutic treatment for this virus either. And that, that's really what makes this uh, so different than, than other things that, that we deal with and, and, and make it so hard. And it's why you, we, we try very hard to keep the cases down, increase our testing capacity and contact tracing and all that sort of stuff, uh, because we don't yet have that vaccine. Last one. Question? You guys ran out of questions. <laughs> yes, how are you? Have you heard from people, whether it's small business people or even mid-sized businesses, saying, you know what, I just can't, I can't hold out anymore? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, even if, yeah, I, I filed for PPP, but the future just looks so bleak that I just can't hang. I, I know it's no point in getting my business up and going again. And have you heard from them? Or, did you have any kind of contact with those kind of business owners? Well, certainly uh, with the um, uh, Resilient Task Force that we've created, the Resiliency Commission that has 15 task forces under it, uh, and, and that's every economic sector in the state, uh, obviously we're getting reports uh, from them, uh, and, and some individuals have, have expressed that. Um, we are trying to make sure people do uh, are aware of the array of things that are out there that could potentially help them. Uh, whether it's the PPP, whether it's the program we have at the, at, here at the, the state level on, on a loan guarantee uh, program that, that, that we've put together, uh, making sure that they know that their employees uh, can uh, re receive unemployment compensation until such time as they can go back to work and so forth. But it is a very difficult time. I mean, there, there's no doubt about that, especially for businesses who, who are of a certain type that, that their, their businesses have been in, interrupted. You know, if you're if you own a hotel right now, uh, extremely hard. Uh, all of those things related to tourism and, and, and so many restaurants, uh, for example, are, are related to, to tourism. This, this is an extremely difficult time. Uh, I happen to be someone uh, who is optimistic and I know we hear the president say this. Uh, I, I believe that we're gonna bounce back quicker than, than, than some people might think, uh, but we're just not there yet. We have, we have some, some, uh, some work to do. Uh, but what I also know is that if you try to forge a path forward too quickly uh, and cases spike again uh, and look something like they looked several weeks ago here in Louisiana, you actually do more 
damage and more lasting damage to our economy than if we try to get it right to begin with and keep those cases down and then reopen in a way that can be sustained over time and can continue to grow. Because if you keep going back and forth between hitting the accelerator and hitting the brakes, I think that's the worst thing that, that can happen. Um, and, and so it's sort of like, uh, and, and I think this analogy was used um, uh, at the national level, this is not a light switch where you go from, from uh, dark to complete light. There's a, it's a dimmer switch, and, and that's what we're, we're trying to get right in balancing uh, the need to reopen the economy as we can with the imperative to protect uh, public health. Um, and, and those things are, are obviously uh, somewhat in conflict, uh, and striking the right balance can be very difficult. And wherever you strike it, there are obviously going to be good people on either side who say you went too fast or you went too slow. Um, that's why we decided to, to take the guesswork out of it and, apl and apply the science, look at the data and see whether it met the criteria. Uh, and, but, but doing it in that approach, we think gives us the best, the chance, the best chance to not have to hit the brakes again uh, and, and to, to bring everything to a, to a screeching halt and it'll allow us to hopefully move forward in, in a way that can be sustained while protecting uh, public health. Uh, there will not be uh, a, well, we're not going to schedule a briefing tomorrow. Uh, that could change, uh, and if it does, we will certainly let you know. Um, and then we will, we will advise you when the next uh, briefing would be, which I suspect will be Thursday at 2.30. Uh, thank you all again for coming. I want to thank the people of Louisiana because they, they have been incredibly uh, strong throughout this and, and uh, done a tremendous job in getting us from where we had the fastest uh, case growth in the country and really in the world, according to Dr. Wagner uh, using the John Hopkins data, uh, to where we are in a much better place uh, today. Uh, and if we can continue this uh, for a while longer, uh, I am very confident that we're going to meet the criteria, transition uh, to phase one while we have the testing capacity and the contract uh, contact tracing capacity in order to to ensure that we can continue uh, down that road in, in, in a way that is safe for the public. So I do want to continue uh, to express my appreciation to the people of Louisiana. Uh, I know this is tough, but I also know that we're strong and resilient and we're going to get uh, through this. So thank all of you and God bless.